all of the nutrients. It's basically that circulatory system that helps trees survive. If the emerald ash borer is consuming this material, think of it this way. If you had something poking holes throughout all of your arteries and veins, you're not going to be able to live very easily, if at all. And in the case of these trees, that's exactly what they're looking at. They are not able to survive this experience. When this happens, the trees become brittle. They're not able to hold their structure very well. Um, a rot can start after the cambium phloem have been severed. It can go throughout the whole tree. The tree just feels spongy and it won't hold together very well. Um, I've even seen instances where people have tried to cut dead ash trees into firewood and it barely makes good firewood. Sometimes you can find a few trees that work, but um, a lot of them are just so brittle that cutting them apart, they just kind of burst apart a little bit. And they represent, unfortunately, a danger. Um, when ash trees have been attacked and are dying from emerald ash borer, they're so brittle that windstorms and uh, other environmental factors can knock them down very easily. You can see in this picture that I'm showing you right now, there's a blazer parked right by that tree. And thankfully, the owner is very lucky in that the tree didn't hit the blazer. Um, and especially during this time of year in Indiana, we experience a lot of problems due to uh, windstorms, harsh thunderstorms, and of course tornadoes, which make these trees very, very dangerous in the areas that they're found in. So I said that one of the best things you can do is monitoring. Try to check to see if your trees have been infested with emerald ash borer. Now, the examples of what I'm showing you here right now, usually this is a little too late in the game. It's uh, one of the few things we can do to try to monitor. You will find these zigzag patterns throughout the cambium and phloem, that soft tissue just under the bark. Um, and you'll see in the picture that it can go all throughout the tree everywhere. We refer to these as galleries. And um, I, I, I wish we could do this in person because I actually have several examples that I can show you, actual real life ones that one landowner was nice enough to give me. Um, when you cut into the wood, they become very, very obvious. And if you just shuck a little bit of the bark off of the tree, you could see it very, very readily. It's very hard to miss. Another thing to look for are D-shaped exit holes. And these are what I use primarily to see if a tree is infested. They're, sometimes they're bigger, sometimes they're smaller. But if you see exit holes and they have this particular shape that you're seeing right now, that is one of the clearest signs that emerald ash borer has been there before you actually try to damage the tree and remove bark. Uh, this is an, an artifact of when the actual insect emerges from the tree. Because as you saw in one of the previous slides, a larva is the actual culprit who creates all the galleries. They overwinter in there, the eggs are laid within the bark, um, and the larva is the one doing the eating. They emerge as adults, and you can see one of them couple of them there kind of poking their little faces out and that is after the damage has been done. Um, one of them, the one that looks like it's further out of the wood, she is probably laying eggs within the tree right now. It's probably like a second generation that's occurring whereas the one that you see kind of in the hole more, that one is most likely in the process of emerging. Another sign that you can look for, and this is one that I see very, very commonly throughout uh, the two counties that I work within, is the signs of woodpecker feeding. Woodpeckers are going for those larvae. They can detect them within the tree wood, and what they're doing is they're trying to get a meal. And you'll know woodpecker feeding because woodpeckers tend to leave holes and damaged areas in the bark, but they tend to go in rings around the tree in very neat straight lines. One of the picture here, unfortunately, doesn't illustrate it very well, but it does show you the gouging damage that a woodpecker will do. And this will be obvious. You'll know that this isn't an insect that did this because since woodpeckers are so much larger, when they try to get into that wood, they're going to gouge away into it. They're not going to leave neat little holes. And those are signs that you can look for there to identify when there may be an insect issue within a tree. Um, oh, and I just wanted to say here, guys, if you have questions, just go ahead, throw them in the chat. I can answer them as I go. I can see the chat pretty clearly right now. So 
don't be afraid to ask a question. There are no dumb questions here. So one of the questions that I do regularly get is, should I treat my ash tree? And this one is a tough one to answer. 99% of the time when someone asks me that, usually it's when the tree is at its worst. I want to stress to you right now that the best thing that you can do is act on this early. And this image shows a really, really good example of when you want to take action. So you see the bar at top there that gives you an idea of less than 10% uh, foliage loss. Fair there is between 10% and 30% foliage loss. And then the worst is when there's more than 30% of the foliage loss from the tree. What this is, this acts as kind of a guidepost for you. If you're at 10% foliage loss, most likely you aren't even aware that there could be any kind of potential problem. And there may not be one. There could be a lot of different things that are causing this loss in foliage. Um, it could be a tree disease. It could be the activity of another insect. It doesn't necessarily mean emerald ash borer. When you hit that between 10 and 30% spot though, you're gonna wanna start thinking about action. Because if it goes above that 30% marker, um, at that point, most likely you have lost the tree and it will not survive the experience. Because as these insects damage the tree, as they lose their cambium phloem, they're also losing a surface area for photosynthesis. It means they're not producing food. They can't do more growing. They can't try to heal from the injuries they've experienced. Now there are options for insecticides to try to trees, most of them are injected, if not all of them. And we have a few publications available and you can search for this publication I'm showing you, Insecticide Options for Protecting Ash Trees from Emerald Ash Borders on the Purdue Ed Store. And you can find that very, very easily. Here, I'm going to type it in the chat. Just type this into your Google search bar and it will take you directly to the Purdue Ed Now, for those of you who aren't aware of how to properly identify your ash trees, in case you're trying to figure out which tree on my property is dying or is this one I need to protect, um, here are a few handy tips to try to identify them. Now, the leaves and branches you're seeing pictured below is just perfect telltale sign that yes, this is an ash tree. The ash tree's leaves are compound. They tend to be feathered shape with five to 11 leaflets. They are arranged opposite on each leaf pedial. Um, and also, you can look at the bark, too, to be able to tell what kind of tree you're looking at. They have a distinctive diamond-shaped pattern on the bark, but you want to use the shape of the leaves. You want to use these shapes right here in combination with the bark to identify them. Because if you look at this bark that I'm showing you right now, um, you can actually find this pattern or something very similar on a few different trees. For example, I think black walnut was one that I used to infuse for ash trees. So use the combination of traits so that way you know what you're looking at. You can also tell by the seeds, they are oar-shaped. They have that little oar-shaped wing, which is how they flutter to new areas, usually thanks to wind activity. And you can see how they're kind of grouped together in clusters there after the seeds have fully formed on the tree. Okay, so I'm going to talk about a couple other pests today, but I want to double check and see if anybody has questions about anything that I've talked about. Um, I know that I went over that a little bit quickly, and I just want to make sure that if you have anything you, you are wanting to know, you get the chance to ask. Okay, well, I'm going to keep on moving. Um, there are several insect pests here in Indiana that are going to attack your trees. Uh, one of the other insect pests that's good to mention is the gypsy moth. Um, this one, a lot of people don't realize is a problem, but unfortunately, it is one. This is not as, uh, I would say, lethal as the emerald ash borer, but it is a problem. Whereas ash borers will only attack ash, you'll really only see them attack ash trees. Gypsy moths, and I think uh, the rest of the insects that I'm going to be talking about today, will be more generalized. They'll attack several different trees. So let's talk a little bit about the gypsy moth's life cycle. Um, when we refer to insects, we typically want to make sure that everyone understands how their life cycle operates throughout the year. 
because that life cycle is going to help inform us on how we can try to control them. Now, in the case of gypsy moth, this insect will initially hatch out uh, roughly around April 23rd. So we're looking at right about now is when we're going to start seeing larval gypsy moth, and they are very, very easy to identify. They're going to stay in that larval form until about mid-June, and then they're going to form these cocoons. Um, these cocoons will often look a little bit like a tomato hornworm cocoon sometimes, though they should be a little bit smaller. And you're going to see them in that cocoon state for about two weeks unless it's fairly warm. Warmer temperatures help insects develop much more quickly. It's going to emerge into its adult form between July and August, and this adult form is great easily identifiable. Um, the wing patterns typically hold up fairly well. Um, the older a moth can get, sometimes that wing pattern will brush off, the scales on its wings will brush off and you won't be able to tell anymore. Usually this one stands out fairly well. And then in late July and August, you'll see the eggs begin to be laid and you'll see these funny uh, cocoon-like things appear on the trees. The adults are just going to lay the eggs on the best food sources they can find and you, you'll be able to tell because they have that nice fuzzy brown appearance to them. Now the caterpillars, like I said, are really easy to identify. They have a, a, an appearance that stands out really well. They have this blue and black patterning on their body with red and blue bumps on them. They'll also have little tufts of hair that are coming out of little spots on and you'll see them just crawling up and down trees that they're currently feeding on. Well, I want to go over a little bit more of this before going off with it. Now, some people are going to think that the uh, caterpillar might be venomous. There are a few caterpillars whose hairs can be venomous or repellent to other animals. Um, in this case, you don't have to worry about that with gypsy moths. Gypsy moths, the, the hairs will break off and sometimes people will be allergic to those hairs. But um, if you get stuck with one, if you even can get stuck with one, um, they're not going to do anything to you. That's just a little defense mechanism to try to keep things away. Um, they're not going to hurt you in that way. All right, so what do they like to eat? I mentioned before that these are generalized herbivores. They are going to eat a variety of things. But what they're going to focus on primarily is going to be the oak species that we have throughout our states. Um, we have lots of different oak species uh, out the window in the room I'm in right now. I'm looking at red oak that's about 40 feet tall in the yard. And these are just spread all over Indiana. Now they're going to preferentially go for white oak, but they are not limited to that. They're just going to preferentially hit oaks first. And then they're going to move on to the next best thing, which could be maple, hickory, witch hazel, pine, or spruce. Uh, these are also uh, different trees that they can consume and be successful on. And what they're going to typically avoid is, of course, they're going to avoid ash trees. Uh, not that they'll find many right now. But they'll also avoid tulip, black locust, and black walnut as well. So those trees will be relatively safe from the gypsy moth. So if you're worried about what's attacking your tree, first identify which species of tree it is. So you can start eliminating uh, which herbivore is currently going after it. Now, there are a few easy ways to try to monitor and to try to remove gypsy moths from your trees, and this is best done while they are caterpillars. So you want to go for that time frame in between April and June to try to remove caterpillars. So what you're seeing right here is this gentleman is putting burlap bag around the tree, with what we call burlap banding. What's going to happen is, is that you can put this around your tree. The gypsy moths have a tendency as caterpillars to go up and down the tree. Um, they're moving up and down to, because when they're on the tree, they're exposed to predators. And as they move downwards, they're doing that to hide from predators. And oftentimes, this corresponds to the time of day. Um, you can cover the burlap in some kind of oil. Um, or they oftentimes the caterpillars will just get trapped in the burlap themselves and you can just take those caterpillars and put them in a bucket of soapy water or maybe some water that you've treated with an insecticide to kill them. I prefer the bucket of soapy water method because it works just as well and you don't have to handle any potentially toxic chemicals as you do your work. 
Now you can get professional help to try to treat these. Oftentimes it'll involve a hydraulic sprayer that will directly spray either sometimes just a jet of water to knock the gypsy moths off or it will actually be spraying a pesticide. Other things you can do is try to get a pesticide injection into the tree. Um, and going back to our emerald ash borer for just a moment, um, when you treat a tree for emerald ash borer, this will almost always involve a pesticide injection where a, a specialist will come out to your home, they will drill a hole in which they'll put some kind of injection apparatus to put the pesticide, and the pesticide will circulate through the tree, which is how they try to kill the insects inside of them. Now, a word of warning, when you choose to do this, if you do choose to do it, this is typically a very expensive prospect, um, numbering in the hundreds of dollars to do. So when you decide to do an injection treatment to a tree, make sure you love that tree because you are going to be paying for it. Hmm, excuse me, I should warn all of you. Um, I have three dogs in my home who have as much cabin fever as I do. So uh, we may occasionally get interrupted by one of my puppies deciding. All right, just keep moving here. There are options for aerial treatments for the caterpillars, and there are a few different insects you can get at aerial treatments for as well. Now, the reason they work well with the caterpillars is because one of the aerial, aerial treatments is BTK. BTK is short for Bacillus thuringiensis kirstiki. What this is, is that this chemical, well, it's not really a chemical. What it is, is it is a derivative of a bacteria. And what this does is the insects will be eating their food and it's been sprayed with BTK and the derivative will enter their bodies and destroy their digestive system. The great thing about BTK and other BT products is that they do not affect anything other than insects. Um, often some insects may be resistant to it, but caterpillars in particular are very susceptible to BT products, which makes this one a good choice when you want to try to treat um, for gypsy moth. And when you're looking at aerial treatments, you're usually looking at gypsy moth or other insect infestations on a fairly wide scale. So you're looking at this if you're a landowner who is considering managing a property to try to uh, get timber out of it one day, or you're a conservationist who's trying to protect an area. Uh, another option for an aerial treatment is what's called mating disruption. Uh, they're talking about the chemical disparlure here. Uh, mating disruption, what this does is this is something that's done when the adults are present. So as the adults are flying, as you have gypsy moss in the air, the mating disruption will fill the area with a pheromone, a chemical that's intended as a message from one organism to another. In this case, it's disrupting the mating pheromone going between the adult male and female moths. Basically, it runs off the theory that if you fill an area just completely with the pheromone, males will not be able to find females. Now, I've actually worked with mating disruption before in my experience, and I can tell you it can be effective. Now, I've worked with it inside of food processing plants in closed areas. So I can't say the kind of efficacy you could expect within an open area like a forest. So what I would do is I would make sure that you talk to people about how effective this is going to be within your area. Um, this is going to be subject to environmental effects. So I would definitely consider talking to a few different specialists before you make the decision on mating disruption. But I can say that when it works, it works very well. Um, there are a couple of other things here that you can potentially apply to control gypsy moth. One of the things, Gypcheck is a virus that you can release amongst them that typically hits the um, larva and it has been proven to be effective in laboratories and other situations, as well as Mimic or Dimillin. This is an insect growth regulator. What this does is it prevents the larval gypsy moth from being able to reach their adult stages. Um, what will happen here is the growth regulator will prevent one of the necessary hormones for insects to develop into adults from releasing, and they'll just stay caterpillars, but unfortunately their bodies aren't designed to do that, so eventually they just die because uh, their hormones have gone crazy and they're just not able to function that way. Let's see, what other species may be affected by aerial treatments? That's an excellent question, Sarah. Um, when you release any chemical in the air, 
you are potentially affecting a lot of different species. Now, the gyp check I would want to look into, but I believe that will be limited to the gypsy moth, as will the mating disruption pheromone. That, those two are guaranteed that they shouldn't affect anything else. Bacillus thuringiensis is going to affect just about any larva that are on plants that are feeding on them that get exposed to it. Generally, this isn't necessarily a bad thing, but if you have protected areas nearby, say someone who's trying to make sure that they have an area for monarchs where there may be some thistle or um, other things where people are trying to encourage pollinator presence, and there are larval, uh, larval members of that species present, the Bacillus thuringiensis may have that effect. This is an instance where I would recommend using things like field check, which we recommend to farmers to check for sensitive areas before you consider aerial treatment options. And of course, there's always the fallback that I always tell people, talk to your neighbors, let them know this is happening before you make any kind of aerial treatment decision. Now the dimillin that's on here as well, that one I would want to look into to see which growth regulator they're using before I could tell you whether or not it's going to affect the insects that are going to be present. I would normally err on the side of caution with this one and say yes, but I would want to double check to see what it is labeled for. And the great thing is any of these treatments before you consider an aerial application or any application at all, Check the labels on those products. They will have labels on them that describe what insects they are going to work on. And you shouldn't be applying it to anything else because the label is the law in this case. So I hope that answers your question, Sarah. That was a good question to ask. All right, keeping on moving. Okay, so when do you want to treat? That is a great question. So when eggs are on trees, you don't want to be treating the eggs directly, except with chemicals that have been specifically treat, uh, labeled for that. Honestly, what I prefer people do is to just go ahead and scrape the eggs off of the trees. That is a surefire way to guarantee that you're not gonna get any kind of pesticide drift or other thing. Um, unfortunately though, that means that that's a lot of manual labor. And while some of you may be only looking at one or two trees that you're treating, if you're a landowner who's looking at timber operations or a conservationist, that is a lot of trees that you may be worried about. So you may want to look at different options for how to spray for them. Um, banding and caterpillar insecticides are by far the best way to handle it because the banding is typically a very effective way that when you, the instances when you put the, that burlap or some other material around the tree to capture those caterpillars so that way um, you can not only monitor populations, but you can easily treat them as well. And it also makes it so that uh, the chances of drift incidences are very low because oftentimes when you band, you've treated what, you, what you're banding around that tree and the caterpillars die when they come into contact with it. Aerial spraying is generally planned for late summer through winter. Like I said, a lot of these affect the adults and that's what you're gonna be looking at. Um, or, you're gonna be looking at the second week of May through over Mother's Day, because then an aerial, that's when you're playing your aerial treatments that are going to be affecting the larva. So I would go by those two dates as your primaries for banding and aerial spraying. Remember that life cycle I talked about. Those are gonna be those moments where you're gonna take action. Okay, so uh, Cliff and Elizabeth thought it was important to include how to identify oak trees since we're talking about gypsy moth. Now, um, I know a lot of you probably know how to identify oak very easily, but we're just going to cover it very quickly. Um, oak all have very telltale leaves with deep lobes in them. You can find them everywhere. Oak also produce those infamous acorns, which I just always drive over with my car in my driveway, is the way I feel like. Acorns can be a variety of sizes based on the species of oak, and you can see them developing. Um, coming up here before too long, our oak are now budding out for their leaves, so we should see them. I'm actually looking out the window now, it looks like my oak is actually starting to spread the leaves a little bit, so we don't have too much longer before the oak trees really start to begin to pollinate. Okay, so this is one that you may not actually be familiar with or its presence, but it is a problem within Indiana. It's called the hemlock woolly, 
Um, I always mispronounce this one, Adelgid. I'm an entomologist and I have trouble pronouncing these, so I'm not gonna uh, expect you guys to be able to. This one you've probably seen before on several trees and you just didn't quite know what you were looking at. So this little guy is actually kind of funny. What he does, it, or she, uh, they, they are this small, dark, reddish-brown insect, but they have this kind of woolly covering over their body. And they're just gonna adhere to a tree leaf, and they are sap suckers. They are just going to stick to that leaf and drain sap out of it over an extended period of time. And in the image here, you're actually seeing one of the adelgids, but it's covered in eggs. And the females are just gonna lay their eggs where they are. They can lay, like it says, up to 300 eggs within their lifetime. Now, what you're looking for here is, this one's going to attack hemlocks pretty readily. And we have a lot of hemlock here in Indiana. And one of the ways you can identify it is that you could see these white filaments of wax on the hemlock sticking to the leaf. And usually people see this and think they have some kind of scale insect. And this insect's pretty closely related to scales. You'll see them even sticking to the leaves after the individual has died because they're, they're not meant to move. They're not gonna travel very far at all. They're just gonna, they spend their whole lives eating and laying eggs and that's about it. So in order to identify your hemlock trees, to know what you're looking at here, you're gonna look for something that has two rows of needles on either side of a twig with blue bands underneath. You're also gonna be looking again at the bark of the tree. Now, you'll find smooth bark on the younger trees, but the mature trees will get thicker bark that's going to have ridges and a kind of orangish tint on it. And I know that throughout um, primarily Owen County, I see these fairly regularly, so I know they're present. And the other thing is that you will see the cones start to turn green uh, before turning brown, and the cones can remain on those trees for years. And I bet a lot of you have noticed these kinds of cones on different trees. So most likely you've seen um, uh, hemlock on your property and may, may not have realized it. Okay, for what I think is our second to last insect that we're gonna talk about today, we are looking at the Asian longhorn beetle. Now we in Indiana so far have been blessed in that we do not have much in the way of Asian longhorn beetle if at all in our state. I show this to you is because eventually it's almost guaranteed we will get this insect. And this insect is a lot like emerald ash borer. It will take out trees very readily. Uh, when I was a student, I did research on a lot of different longhorn beetles. Thankfully, we did not identify this one in Indiana, but all longhorn beetles tend to do a lot of damage where they go. So just like with the gypsy moth, we're going to look at the life cycle of these insects. They are going to be laid as an egg into the tree. They're going to stay in their larval stage for one to two years, and they're just going to uh, make their own little holes throughout the trees doing something very similar to em em uh, emerald ash borer. Their pupa you can identify because it's going to kind of look like the adult insect, but kind of like it's been cast in wax. What this is called is an exorate pupa. Instead of making a cocoon that completely obfuscates the insect, they just kind of freeze in place and grow into an adult form, which they'll eventually hatch out of until they become the adult insect that you're seeing in the picture. You can see signs of this insect's presence because if you look at this tree, you're beginning to see uh, deadening in several of the branches on the tree already. And the leaves that you're looking at here, you can see a yellowish tint occurring. This is a pretty good sign that there's something going on with this tree. It's losing its ability to transport nutrients and crown depth is beginning. You can also tell that there are a lot of holes throughout the tree. Remember what I was saying about emerald ash borer too. Look for the woodpecker feeding. You can begin to see a present. You be, if you begin to see woodpeckers there, you know that the in, some kind of insect is present in that tree. So how do we identify heavily infested trees? Here's a good start to it. You can notice the holes. There's woodpecker damage. There's something that's been chewing through this tree. The damage is a little more evident on the outside of it as opposed to the inside, like what we would see with emerald ash borer. You can also find the larvae pretty readily. The larvae are very large. Um, sometimes you can actually pick them out of the tree because unlike emerald ash borer, some of the holes are closer to the surface. 
the holes that are being formed by the actual Asian longhorn beetle are quite large. You can see that whoever took this picture was able to successfully put a number two pencil into that hole, and that's very, very large. That's because if you look at our picture of Asian longhorn beetles on the back, that's on someone's finger. So this is a very large beetle. They are very obvious. You'll know when they're present. And you can see some of this mush right here. This is most likely boring damage that's been pushed out from the tree due to the insect. Um, as they're eating in the tree, they're also doing their business. And we refer to this as frass. So the insect has probably pushed its own frass out of the tree or it's just kind of building up in place. Uh, not a very pretty picture. So which trees are, do you need to worry about when it comes to Asian longhorn beetle? So what's gonna make a good host for these guys? And keep in mind, most insects are gonna choose the best host first before they move on to something that's gonna be poor or secondary to them. So our maple trees are going to be at risk. And heaven knows we have a lot of maple here in Indiana. Horse chestnuts or buckeyes, we have some of them present. Elm. We don't have a great big presence of elm right now in Indiana, but if you go amongst some of the woodlots in rural areas, you can actually find populations of elm beginning to redevelop pretty healthily throughout our state. And willow, we have a lot of willow here in Indiana, especially if you're an Owen County resident, you can find willows all over the place because we have so many natural springs, ponds, and other water sources. Now as for other hosts that they might choose, this is going to be the secondary host can't find anything better. We're going to be looking at birch being infested with. Birch will show the signs of um, Asian longhorn beetle presence very easily. Sycamore, we have plenty of sycamore throughout Indiana, usually close to water sources. Poplar, which we have plenty of, and sometimes tulip poplar is used as a tree in the timber industry. Mimosas, which I see here in Terrapo quite a bit. Katsura and ash trees. Now obviously ash we don't have many of them remaining, at least not many healthy populations, but we do want to try to preserve those healthy populations we do have. And while some of them are showing signs of resistance to emerald ash borer, that resistance doesn't necessarily translate into resistance to Asian longhorn beetle. So if you're worried about your ash trees, monitor, 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 keep an eye on them. There's more than one thing that can get them out there. And golden rain tree. This one I have not seen that much of, but I do know some areas of Indiana will have golden rain tree presence. Uh, mountain ash, hackberry, which we have a significant population of hackberry throughout Indiana, and several more trees. I believe it was somewhere in the neighborhood about 50 different hosts exist for this one, but I'd want to double check that number before I guarantee it. Okay, so identifying some of these trees, elm trees, uh, we don't see as many elm anymore because of the Dutch elm disease that wiped out a lot of populations in the previous century, though they are beginning to make a comeback. Um, you can tell that you have an elm tree when you see these particular ridged veins on a leaf that's kind of ovate in shape with a kind of spear tip at the end of it. But maples are the ones that are going to be the biggest ones to worry about for Asian longhorn. We all know what maple leaves look like, right? So just look at the Canadian flag. That's a maple leaf right there. You can also tell maples because of the uh, winged seeds that they produce that we sweep out of our, or mow out of our yards every year, uh, sweep off our sidewalks. Very, very clear, very obvious. All right, the last one that I'm going to talk about today is our spotted lantern fly. This is an insect that is not yet present here in Indiana, thank goodness, but we are very, very concerned about it because it is coming from the east. It is on its way. And before too long, we will begin to see spotted lantern fly in Indiana. This one is a major pest of grapes. And we do have a lot of people who do grapes in this area of Indiana. There are at least two wineries within driving distance of my office. Um, what they will do is they will just uh, put their mouth parts into the Tree. They will suck out sap. They can utterly destroy grape brambles or grape mines. I'm sorry. Um, here, this is actually a video, and I'm going to see if it's going to play and it's going to show you something going on. I'm going to talk while it's playing. All right, hopefully that is playing for you guys. You notice how there's liquid dripping as though it's raining ever so slightly there? What this is, is as these insects consume sap, their bodies aren't able to process that much sugar very easily. So 
they'll do is they will excrete a lot of that sugar on honeydew. And this tree is so infested with them that it's kind of raining honeydew. And wherever this stuff lands, if it's on like a leaf or something, it'll cause instances of sooty mold to develop on those trees or on those plants. So a nasty thing to look for, unfortunately, but it is one of the side effects of having spotted land. Now again, we're gonna be looking at our life cycles here. We're gonna see that uh, the first instars are gonna hatch out in April through June, and they're gonna develop all the way through July. And these shapes that you see, these pictures right here are very telltale. That's exactly what they look like. When they hit their fourth instar, they're gonna gain this bright red color. This is just before they become an adult. Adults will come out in July and last through September. They'll begin laying eggs in September. I'm sorry, the last through December, they'll lay, start laying eggs in September. And they'll keep going for as long as the temperatures allow and they'll lay this egg mass on whatever host plants they're interested in. Here is a great example of the eggs. Now I'm gonna ask a question of you guys. Where are the eggs? Can anyone see them? Don't be shy, go ahead and answer in chat. If you see the eggs, if you think you know what they are, try to tell me what they are. Where are they at? Or tell me what part of the picture they're in. Oh, come on, nobody's brave right now. So I will go ahead and tell you. Notice the, yeah, no clue, that's pretty fair. Sometimes these things can be really hard to identify. Look at the little spots right towards the center of the picture that looks like it's dried, cracked mud. Yes, Sarah, that is exactly right. Those are the egg masses that have been laid by the spotted lanternfly. Those are kind of hard to identify, aren't they? They just look like mud that's on the tree that sat there and dried up. So you can see some of the challenge involved with trying to manage these things there. You see trees that are just utterly infested with them, and then the egg masses are really hard to find unless you know exactly what you're looking for. So, and there's a circle that they put in there. I didn't realize that one was there. So you can see exactly where those are. Now, what do they eat? Spotted lanternfly very readily consumes grapes. They will be a major problem to anyone growing grapes. Their infestations can be very heavy on that plant. Uh, they will go for several other plants as well. So you can see here, looks like we got some maple and oak maybe. And of course, they are not restricted to simply trees. They will also go to flowers. So this is a great example of a pest that, um, while it may prefer a host, it can be very generalized still. If it's big enough to hold the lantern fly, it looks like that they're gonna go after and eat those things, eat those plants regardless. And Elizabeth made the comment on here that there are at least 70 more host plants that spotted lanternfly will be more than happy to consume. So when and if it arrives in our state, we know that this pest is going to be a major pest. We are looking at something that's going to be very similar to Japanese beetle when it arrives. However, there is one bright side to this story. Uh, spotted lanternfly loves tree of heaven. And for those of you who aren't aware of what this is, Tree of Heaven is a nasty invasive species. Um, this species is relatively easy to identify. You can see the leaf shapes there. The bark in the pit stinks up to high heaven. It is one of the worst smelling trees that you will run into. And you can also look at the leaf scarring on the branches for this kind of spade shape. That's a way that you know that you're looking at Tree of Heaven. So, Spotted lanternfly will be great for helping us control that invasive species. However, um, it will represent a problem for other species that we don't want to lose. So what can you do? Um, it says here to keep treating your trees, but that's kind of hard to do when it's not here yet. So what I want you guys to do is keep your eyes open wherever you travel. Keep an eye out. Spotted lanternfly has very, very bright colors. So Denise asked in the chat, should we contact our extension office if we see these? Yes, absolutely. Contact your local extension educator the minute you find them. Um, I believe one of the slides on here in just two more slides, I think has some uh, other places who you can contact to try to let people know that you've spotted the spotted lanternfly, no pun intended there. Uh, but the biggest thing, like Denise was saying, report. Report this. Uh, edmaps.org is one website that helps you do the reporting. 
If nothing else, you can talk to your local extension educator. Great Lakes um, Eden is the organization I believe that helps run Head Talks. You can also call 1-866-663-9684 to do your reporting if you're not sure if you want to bother going to the website. I know some of us may have connection issues in our areas. Or you can email um, anybody up in Purdue Entomology, Elizabeth Barnes or Cliff Sadoff are always accepting emails identifying um, invasive tree insects. If you want, you can just simply email me since you guys probably live and work within the area that I'm located in. I'm gonna put my email in the chat right now. So that way you have a place to contact if you identify them. And when you report this, we're going to want to know where are you? We want to know where these are located so we can come out there and um, just make sure, verify for ourselves. Yes, this is that species. Take a picture of it and send it to us. You could send them to me. Like I said, I'm an entomologist and I know how to identify these things. This one's very easy to identify. And I always love getting pictures of bugs. Um, you could try to actually collect a living or dead specimen of them. Or you can oftentimes find dead insects around an infestation and bring it into your local extension office. Um, if you don't live in one of my counties, you can always bring it to the extension educator there and I guarantee you, if they don't know what it is, they're probably gonna call me and ask. All right, so here's some information on how to get that reporting done, just the stuff we've already talked about a little bit. And like I said, um, Elizabeth and Cliff always love getting emails from people who may potentially be identifying invasive species and they always welcome the help. Okay, so now that we have gotten through just about all of our slides, yep, that's the end of it. Um, I wanted to check and see if you guys